Good evening everyone and a warm welcome to St John's College um, and welcome this evening to the first of an exciting programme of events with Dr Ian Bostrich who is this year's Humanitas Visiting Professor in Classical Music and Music Education. It's a particular pleasure this evening to welcome Ian because Ian is an alumnus of this college and I'm delighted to say also one of our honorary fellows. Ian came up to Oxford in 1983 to read modern history, graduating with a first in 1986 and continuing on to complete a doctorate. He was taught by Ross McGibbon and Malcolm Vale, and of course by Keith Thomas, whose influence can be clearly seen in his thesis, Debates About Witchcraft in England, 1650 to 1736. Ian's thesis was published by Oxford University Press in 1997 as Witchcraft and Its Transformations. I'm sure that tonight and during the course of the week, we will be bewitched by Ian in many ways. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Jason Staniek, our fellow in ethnic musicology, who is going to introduce and chair the lecture. My name is Jason Staniek, and I am a tutorial fellow in ethnomusicology here at St. John's College and the academic director of the Humanitas Professorship in Classical Music and music education. And I'm here to welcome you to a lecture being offered through the Humanitas program, a series of visiting professorships at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, intended to bring leading practitioners and scholars to both universities to address major themes in the arts, social sciences, and the humanities. Created by Lord Weidenfeld, the program is managed and funded by the Institute for strategic dialogue with the support of a series of generous benefactors. It is administered by the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities. St. John's College has the enormous privilege to host the, the Humanitas Professorship in Classical Music and Music Education, a chair made possible by the generous support of Mick Davis. Previous holders of this chair have been the pianist Imogen Cooper and the violinist Midori. This year's professorship in classical music and music education is held by Ian Bostridge, a remarkable musician and scholar and someone, as President Snowling has just told you, well known to us here in Oxford. The Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero has written that the human voice reveals the true, vital, and perceptible uniqueness of the one who emits it. We know this instinctively because one of the principal ways we navigate the human social world is through our apprehension of the distinctive voices of others. We also know that there are voices that are so unique and compelling that they begin to index more than just the person emitting that particular voice. These voices start to get bound up with histories that exceed any individual person, that resonate widely, that stand in for expansive hopes and desires. Ian Bostridge has one of those voices. Since the mid-1990s, his voice has been heard far and wide in the world's most elite concert halls and opera houses. He has performed with an expansive cross-selection of the world's major orchestras under the world's very finest conductors and alongside the very best accompanists. His voice has found a home in an extensive repertoire from Schubert and Schumann Lieder to Britain operas from Dowland to Hans Werner Henze. His recordings have won Grammy and Gramophone Awards, and his interpretations have been praised, often feverishly, by critics. <coughs> Writing in The Guardian in 2011, Nicholas Rowe cited one, of, cited one critic's words about a memorable early Bostridge performance of Schubert's Winterreise. 
In all the many performances heard in concert halls and on records, I had never really believed in the Ich, the protagonist, had never truly thought that there was any such person with a childhood, a nickname, a particular way of tilting his head. Now he stood in full view. It is not enough to say that Ian has a unique and poignant singing voice. He also possesses a rather refined scholarly voice. And his writing, as it appears in his books and in his articles for leading publications such as The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement, Opera Now, The Independent, is distinctive and absorbing. A singer's notebook, oh, sorry, but skip that, sorry. Um, the lecture we are to hear today on Vinteriza is in anticipation of Ian's soon to be published book, Schubert's Winter Journey, Anatomy of an Obsession, a 523 page meditation on Schubert's famous song cycle. The book will be published officially in January 2015, but Kirkus already has a review posted online. Who won't be tempted by a book that, according to the Kirkus reviewer, treats readers to some things they would not expect? The history of postal delivery, the scientific explanation of the will of the wisp, the theme of loneliness in romantic art, and the differences between crows and ravens. We look forward to that book and to the other events that Ian will lead this coming week. For sure, the extended residencies provided by the Humanitas program give us a remarkable opportunity to see eminent performers, scholars, and pedagogues from a number of different angles, almost prismatically. Tomorrow at the Hollywell, we will hear Ian with the pianist Julius Drake in a recital of songs of Schumann, Liszt, and Richard Strauss. On Friday, November 21st, there will be a full day symposium called Voice, Memory, Song that will put Ian in conversation with 16 distinguished scholars working across a number of disciplines in the humanities and the social sciences. And on Sunday afternoon at the Sheldonian Theater, he will lead an open rehearsal and masterclass on Mahler orchestral songs with the Oxford Orchestra, University Orchestra and three very talented young singers. But it's today, and we have the enormous privilege to hear Ian's lecture, Why Winterreise, Schubert's Song Cycle, Then and Now. We are absolutely delighted that he has returned to St. John's to spend a few days with us. And please join me in welcoming Ian Bostridge to the stage. Um, thank you very much, Jason, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for your applause. Um, as a singer, I'm very often asked uh, things about the singer's life because it's such an unfamiliar and strange life, and people say, are you nervous? when you go on stage. And I say, no, of course I'm not nervous. I do this all, all the time. I sing all the time. If I was nervous, it would be unbearable. But I can tell you that today I feel, feel very nervous. Uh, <laughs> I've only given one lecture before in my life, uh, and that was 14 years ago. So this is, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm delighted and, and honored to be giving this lecture, um, and especially to be delivering it in my old college, St. John's, where I studied for six years in the 80s, first as an undergraduate historian with uh, the legendary tutorial team of Malcolm Vale, Ross McKibben, and Keith Thomas. I've written legendary, but I think terrifying would also be the word, especially because they're in the audience at the moment, along with my, um, my, one of my DPhil examiners, I see. So. Um, <clears throat> and then I worked as a graduate student uh, writing a DPhil thesis on witchcraft belief in the pre-enlightenment under the supervision of Keith Thomas. Uh, in those days, singing was just a hobby. But I sang my first Winterizer, Schubert's Winter Journey, the 24 song Colossus of the lead repertoire here in St. John's in the President's Lodgings in January 1985, nearly 30 years ago, as a second year undergraduate. During my time as a graduate student, the president of that time, Bill Hayes, who I also see in the audience, generously organized for a college grant so that I could start having singing lessons. I remember correcting text and sorting out footnotes on my DPhil thesis while attending one of the song classes at the Britain Peers School in Snape. 
back in 1990. That's probably enough reminiscence, but I did want to record my debt to this place and the continuing sense of institutional connection is vital for me personally in a freelance profession and as I'm sure it is for many others in a world where the creative and not so creative destruction and change affected by global capital sometimes seems to give us very little to hang on to, very little permanent. I'm not qualified to say an enormous amount about the education part of my brief, but I wanted to do a little before I moved on to Winterreiser. Um, I did do some teaching as a graduate student and as a research fellow at Corpus, mostly in the long 18th century and political and social theory. Uh, my memory of teaching, and a lot of people here will be pleased to hear this, is, is that when I had a whole day of it, it was very hard work. And I remember it as a lot more draining and more demanding of self-exposure in some ways than a day's opera rehearsal or a song recital at Carnegie Hall, where you can hide behind the constructed and in some ways conventional persona of the performer. I have taught little as a singer, but when I have taught, I found it to be instructive and improving, uplifting even. I learn a lot from my students about the things I'm un unable to do as a singer. Though one of the most interesting things about this sort of teaching is that what one seeks to correct is often at the heart of a singer's style and personality. How to give them more confidence and ease without destroying creative wrinkles or I idiosyncrasies is tricky. More generally, as a teacher of singing, you're doing in a smaller way the same sort of thing this college and its tutors does. Passing on, even enforcing a tradition, at the same time as trying to renew it, forming a link between past and present, whether personally or institutionally. Sorry, I'm just getting a lot of bumping. Uh, is that better? Yeah. As a singing teacher, you have to do all the things other teachers do. Encourage, provoke, inspire, demand, but with an extra eye and ear to the complexities and paradoxes of the relationship and the feedback loops which mediate between mental instruction and physical outcome. A lot of the work uses metaphor, sometimes rather strange metaphor. I was once told to try balancing a ball on a jet of water uh, that when I was singing. Uh, apparently ridiculous instruction, but it did actually work. The pathways to successful performance remain, thankfully, mysterious, but you can find yourself spouting a lot of stuff about the vocal mechanism, which would make no sense at all to a physiologist. My own career trajectory <coughs> reinforces my intuitions about what education should be. The process of education remains, like performance, a mysterious one. In my own case, I had an exceptionally thorough training as a historian, but I had no formal training at all as a singer, which, while it's unusual nowadays, is not totally unknown. This professorship is concerned with classical music, with education, and is called a humanitas professorship. In all the years since I first entered higher education in 1983, there's been a sustained campaign in this country to devalue or deny the relevance of an education in the humanities, a humane, a liberal education, even to subvert its very meaning. What is a liberal education? What might, what should it be? Perhaps liberal in the sense of free-ranging, so that the unexpected can be discovered and experienced by student and teacher alike that the intellect might soar and know no boundaries. In this sense, a liberal education may, and indeed should, consist as much of science as of history or classics or music. Applying dubious metrics to second-guess the outcomes of either education or research in our universities, bringing the methods of accountancy and the business school too closely to bear on the actual process is utterly self-defeating. As in the capitalist process itself, waste is an inevitable concomitant, and promising pathways may sometimes, unfortunately, turn out to be blind alleys, but we still need to follow them. The intuition of the gifted researcher has to be trusted. Risks have to be taken. The model of university in which teaching is undertaken by those engaged in research is a crucial part of this liberal process. It has an intrinsic value, but also a social function, both in the production of useful knowledge and, as far as students are concerned, in the development of flexibility and intellectual focus. Another sense of liberal education 
is that it should be for the student genuinely free and not turned into a market commodity or a preparation for a more or less lucrative career. Basing university funding policies on the notion that a degree brings higher earning capacity for an individual is bound to lead to a narrowing of choices and a subversion of the idea of a university. Once again, it needs to be underlined that the study of theoretical physics or English literature or history is valuable in and of itself, and that, over and above that intrinsic value, we all have an interest in having a well-educated citizenry. But if we want to look at the purpose of universities in truly economic rather than accounting terms, the relevant concept is one elaborated in a recent book by an economist of this college, John Kay, the notion of obliquity. In general, he writes, oblique approaches recognise that complex objectives tend to be imprecisely defined and contain many elements that are not necessarily or obviously compatible with one another, and that we learn about the nature of the objectives and the means of achieving them during a process of experiment and discovery. Oblique approaches often step backward to move forward, or as Emily Dickinson poetically puts it, tell all the truth but tell it slant, success in circuit lies. <coughs> I feel all this particularly strongly, no doubt, because it's personal for me. I trained as a historian. I was supported by local authority grants, central government funds, my parents, by academic institutions to pursue a discipline which did not, in the end, lead to a career. But that discipline nurtured in me, I would hope, habits of focus, imaginative engagement and intellectual rigour, which have been crucial to my work on stage, in the concert or recital hall and in the recording studio. But the contribution, the vital contribution of education, has been an oblique one. One of the main ways through which this ideal of liberal education works in its vision of unconstrained but disciplined intellectual exchange is through what one might call the circulation of metaphor, so that the most unlikely of disciplines can offer inspiration to each other. This exchange is embodied in the social practices of an Oxford college, dining together being only the most convivial of a whole range of examples. And the currents run both ways. Sciences inspire the arts, and the arts the sciences. My favourite historical example involves music. Musical metaphor has played a crucial role, role as midwife in the physical sciences from the time of Pythagoras on. Musical theory was a crucial, if publicly underplayed, component in Isaac Newton's understanding of light, through an analogy between the colour spectrum and the musical scale, the seven notes of the scale before the return to the octave being analogous to the colours of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue and violet, plus indigo, the strangely superfluous one. The reason there are seven is because there are seven notes in the scale. More significantly, Newton interpreted Pythagoras's views on musical consonants as containing the essence of the inverse square law of gravitation, his dazzling solution to the unity of celestial and terrestrial dynamics. Thus Newton, a sort of Pythagorean magus, reinterpreted the notion of the harmony of the spheres. If anyone thinks this sort of intellectual midwifery by metaphor is a thing of the past, they only need consider one of the most familiar to the layman foundational physical theories currently in play, string theory. The true meaning of string theory may lie inaccessible to most of us, even to most scientists, in the complexities of its mathematical for for formulation. And its acceptance or non-acceptance will undoubtedly hang upon experimental data. But it owes at least some of its origins and perhaps even its appeal to the strength of the musical metaphor which lies at, or at least around, its core. At the beginning of the last century, the sociologist Max Weber wrote about the disenchantment of the world and the encroachment of an iron cage, or in a more correct translation, hard steel casing of rationality. The German is a Stahlhartes Gehäuse. One of the jobs of the university is, paradoxically, to resist with reason the pernicious advance of such heedless rationalisation with its culture of homogeneity, which can only result in intellectual entropy and what Weber himself called a polar night of icy darkness. 
<clears throat> I now want to talk about, and with the help of pianist Osman Tack, perform a little of the monstrous sacre of the German song tradition, Schubert's Winterreise. I call it a sacred monster because of its enormous status and potency within the tradition of classical music, the sense of almost holy awe with which it is received. Because that status, that status is such that the reasons for the cycle's cultural eminence are only, it seems to me, narrowly discussed and largely taken for granted. But also because it is a scary monster for many potential listeners, and one which, in a fate common to much classical music in our era, is not always given its due. I'm sure performers always think this about the pieces they love and perform, but it isn't as well known as it should be. I should say, by the way, uh, that this talk is something of an experiment, as I'll be talking and singing, two very different uses of the vocal cords, and I've been in America for two weeks with a cough, so it may go very strangely, but I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, Winterizer, Winter Journey, a cycle of 24 songs for voice and piano was composed by Franz Schubert towards the end of his short life. He died in Vienna, aged only 31 in 1828. Schubert was renowned even in his own lifetime as a song composer of matchless fecundity and a master of seductive melody. The winter journey apparently discombobulated his friends. One of the closest of these, Josef von Spahn, remembered 30 years later how the cycle had been received by Schubert's circle of friends. For some time, Schubert appeared very quiet and very upset and melancholy. When it asked him what was troubling him, he would only say, soon you will hear and understand. One day he said to me, come over to Schobus today and I will sing you a cycle of horrifying songs, Schauerliche Lieder. I'm anxious to know what you will say about them. They have cost me more effort than any of my other songs. So he sang the entire winter journey through to us in a voice full of emotion. We were utterly dumbfounded by the mournful, gloomy tone of these songs. And Schober, the rascal of the group, said that only one, the linden tree, had appealed to him. So this, Schubert replied, I like these songs more than all the rest, and you will come to like them as well. <coughs> Another close friend with whom Schubert had shared digs some years before was Johann Meyerhofer, government official and poet. Schubert set some 47 of his poems to music. For Meyerhofer, Winter Journey was an expression of personal trauma. He had been long and seriously ill, had gone through disheartening experiences, and life had shed its rosy colour. Winter had come for him. The poet's irony, rooted in despair, appealed to him. He expressed it in cutting tones. Spaun confounded even more dramatically the personal and the aesthetic in his account of the cycle's genesis. There is no doubt in my mind, he wrote, that the state of excitement in which he wrote his most beautiful songs, and especially his winter journey, contributed to his early death. There's something profoundly mythologizing, is there not, about these accounts, especially Spaun's, which has something of, it's a bit like Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the dejection, the friends who miss the point, the sense of a profound mystery that will only be understood after the death of its progenitor. As against the persistent legend of poor Schubert, unappreciated, unloved, unsuccessful in his own lifetime, it's worth remembering that he earned well from his music, was welcomed into the salons of the well-connected, if not the aristocracy, and earned critical plaudits as well as his fair share of brickbats. Schubert was probably the first of the canonical great composers in the Austro-German tradition, to operate entirely as a freelancer outside the security and restriction of a church position or noble patronage and allowing for a certain youthful fecklessness he did well for himself his music was second only to Rossini's for its popularity on Viennese, Viennese programs it was played by most of the great instrumentalists of the day <coughs> and his fees were substantial winter journey itself did not fall stillborn from the press here is one contemporary review from the Theaterzeitung, the theatre newspaper, of the 29th of March, 1828. Schubert's mind shows a bold sweep everywhere, whereby he carries everyone away with him who approaches, and he takes them through the immeasurable depth of the human heart into the far distance, where premonitions of the infinite dawn upon them longingly in a rosy radiance, but where at the same time the shuddering bliss of an inexpressible presentiment 
is accompanied by the gentle pain of the constraining present, which hems in the boundaries of human existence. Despite the slightly windy romantic rhetoric, the writer has clearly perceived and engaged with, with what has become the acknowledged canonical sublimity of the cycle, that transcendental quality which transmutes what could so easily be mistaken for a self-indulgent parade of disappointed love lyrics. For the initiate, Winter Journey is one of the great feasts of the musical can cal calendar, an austere one, but one almost guaranteed to touch the ineffable heights as well as the heart. After the, long, after the last song, the hurdy-gurdy man, the silence is usually palpable, the sort of silence that otherwise only something like a Bach passion can summon up. Yet the very notion of the initiate will set some alarm bells ringing. It's one of the reasons for writing or talking about and around the piece rather than simply performing it, to explain, to justify, to contextualise and embroider. Piano-accompanied song is no longer part of everyday domestic life and has lost its one-time primacy in the concert hall. Art song, as the Americans call it, what Germans know as leader, is a niche product, even within the niche that is classical music. But Winter Journey <coughs> is a great work of art which should be as much part of our common canonical experience as the poetry of Shakespeare and Dante, the paintings of Van Gogh and Pablo Picasso, the novels of the Bronte sisters or Marcel Proust. It remains telling that the piece lives and makes an impact in concert halls all over the world, in cultures very remote from the circumstances of its origins in Vienna of the 1820s. There are all sorts of reasons why Winter Journey has an extraordinary depth, resonance and power. A collection, an album, as it were, of 24 songs, 24 discrete musical events, it nevertheless adds up to one of the great romantic adventures in music, a whole as compelling as a Beethoven symphony, but constructed out of what appear to be disconnected fragments. This is part of its aesthetic, an influential part, and one only amplified by the way Schubert came upon Wilhelm Müller's poetic cycle. He initially found 12 poems in an almanac and hungrily set them to music. Only later did he discover the final and complete version of the poetic cycle in Müller's collection from the posthumous papers of a travelling horn player in which 12 extra poems were interleaved to form a fuller narrative. Schubert simply took these extra poems and set them as they came, higgledy-piggledy, to form the second half of his final conception, giving Schubert's Winterreiser an extraordinary sense of splintered, deferred or withheld narrative, which seems exceptionally modern. But Schubert did craftily introduce larger structures into his cycle. Musicologists give a, a, a lot of attention to key and key relationships. But given Schubert's readiness to change keys for the convenience of singers and publishers, and the demonstrable difficulty audiences, even highly trained audiences, having in, have in discerning these sorts of complex relationships in real time, it's motivic relationships that really count, I'd say. Listen here to how the end of the fourth song, Erstarung, or Frozen Numb, segues into the beginning of the next and most beloved song of the cycle, Der Lindenbaum, The Linden Tree. <laughs> So that, that figure at the end, that sort of urgent, pulsating figure at the end of Erstarung turns into the rustling at the beginning of, of uh, Lindenbaum. Uh, similarly, listen to the end of Lindenbaum, the end of the song Linden Tree, with its insistent little figure in the piano, and how that feeds into the beginning of the song after that Wasserflut, or flood. It's stretched out, but it's the same shape. <laughs>
I'm not sure that audiences explicitly make these connections. It took me years to notice them. But they can operate, one would imagine, on a level below that of conscious recognition and are perhaps all the more powerful for that. Unpicking the musical texture of Winterizer is one way of understanding its appeal and impact. I still seem to be rattling. Sorry. I'll try this. Um, another is to talk about its contemporary context and modern resonances. I'd like to do that by looking in detail at the first song of the cycle, Gute Nacht, or Good Night. I'll read the poem in English, perform it with Osman, and then discuss it. I came a stranger, I depart a stranger. May was good to me, with many a garland of flowers. The girl, she talked of love. The mother, even of marriage. Now the world is so gloomy, the way is shrouded in snow. I cannot choose the time of my journey, must find my own way in this darkness. A moonbeam goes along as my companion, and on the white meadows I look for tracks of deer. Why should I hang around any longer, waiting for someone to throw me out? Let stray dogs howl in front of their master's house. Love loves to wander. God made it that way, from one to another. Sweetest love, good night. I won't disturb you in your dream. It would be a shame to disturb your rest. You oughtn't to hear my footstep. Softly, softly, the door closes. I'll write on the gate as I go by. Good night, so you can see I've thought of you. And just thinking again about that unpicking of the piece, the particularly magical Schubertian thing in this song is the change from the minor to the major key in the last verse. Mein Gefährte, die 
This is one of those songs that seems to have been going on forever at the moment that it starts. Repeated, moderately paced quavers trudge across the page and on through the song, relentless, intertwined at first with a dispiriting, descending figure broken by the stabs of accents, which in Schubert's manuscript are stabs of pain. In that same manuscript, Schubert has given the song the tempo marking Messig in gehende Bewegung, or moderate at a walking pace. And that walking motion, like a dying fall, is a touchstone of the whole work. A winter journey, moving from one place to another, but in a sense privileging motion above all else, the need to get away, to be a wanderer in the 19th century's sense, the wandering Jew, the flying Dutchman, on the road in the 20th century's. Jack Kerouac, Highway 61. Why does the man singing these songs need to get away? We don't really know, though it's often assumed that we do, and that he's been rejected in love and has to move on. The information we are given is, in fact, sketchy to a point. The girl talked about love, the mother even of marriage. The phrase is repeated in Schubert's setting, rising in pitch and expectation. Then a great gulf opens up, a sort of depressive caesura marking the end of hope a turn from the inside warmth of the past to the bitterness of the landscape which, will which we will henceforth inhabit. Now the world is so murky, the way is shrouded in snow. But remember, it's not clear what drove him out. We do hear a sort of intimacy in the piano part, a memory of it at least, in the way the upper and lower voices call and reply. <laughs> details of what broke it up are missing. Did he dump her? Did she dump him? Was the mother's talk about marriage a sort of hopeful mirage or a nightmare vision for an itinerant commitment foe? Has he been doing this his whole life? Why is he here in this house, in this town at this hour? Has he been staying, visiting, dropping by? It's night time and everyone's asleep. Part of the key to this lies in the poet Wilhelm Müller's immersion in things Byronic. He published major essays on the poet of Child Harold and Don Juan in German in the 1820s. That, uh, and he immersed himself in what we might call the Byronic method of absence, something Byron himself had taken and developed from Walter Scott, the poet rather than the novelist he later became, the poet of Marmion. Muller's protagonist is like a Byronic hero wrapped in an aura of mystery. I came a stranger, a stranger I depart, is how he introduces himself. A tragic figure the roots of whose predicament are never satisfactorily revealed. As he says himself, significantly much later in the cycle when the poet's imprecision has done its work, almost mocking this Byronic model, Haber ja doch nichts begangen, dass ich Menschen sollte scheuen. I haven't done anything that means I ought to shun human company. It's almost a question, have I? You tell me. This mystery was at the core of the Byron cult itself, a cult which fed the poetry. He was a poet associated with his own poetic voice in an unprecedented way. It is difficult, one reader, Annabella Milbank, wrote in 1814, she married Byron a year later, it is difficult to believe that he could have known these beings so thoroughly, but from introspection. Byron lived out the mythology of his own poetic narratives, fragmented narratives like those of Winterreiser, by becoming an exile, a wanderer, cast out for a dark and mysterious crime which turned out some decades later to have been incest with his own half-sister. Yet there's no suggestion of a terribly dark crime in Winterizer. Our wanderer is no Manfred or ancient mariner. There's also no hint that at the time he wrote it, the happily married Wilhelm Müller was living out the experiences of his protagonist. It's as a sort of allegory about German political alienation in the post-Napoleonic, Metternich-dominated period that the cycle can relate to Müller's own circumstances when he wrote the poems. But that's not an exhaustive or even perhaps a mainstream reading of the poems or of the cycle, though hints and coded references to political and social disaffection are scattered through Winterreiser and form a crucial background to its genesis. 
But <coughs> typically for the period in which it was written, it's a very domestic predicament that primarily yields this existential angst, one rooted in a Biedermeier setting, a world away from the melodrama of Scott's Marmion or Byron's Manfred. This is, no doubt, why Miller's verse so appealed to the great deflator of romantic excess, Heinrich Heine. It is also this ordinariness, surely, the source of the cycle's originality and of its power. Yet that Byronically inspired absence of a clear narrative mise en scène, the stinginess with information, is a vital part of the way we become implicated in our protagonist's fate, a piece of poetical legerdemain. We are drawn in by an obsessively confessional soul, apparently an emotional exhibitionist, who won't give us the facts. But this allows us to supply the facts of our own lives and make him our mirror. At the same time, the great waves of unattached subjectivity in these poems, unconstrained by plot or even character, we know so little from a conventional point of view about this man. The infinite depths suggest precisely why Müller, of all Schubert's contemporaries, so cried out for his poems to be set to music. I can neither play nor sing, yet when I write verses, I sing and play after all. If I could produce the melodies, my songs would be more pleasing than they are now. But courage. Perhaps there is a kindred spirit somewhere who will hear the tunes behind the words and give them back to me. He wrote this in his diary in 1815, on his 21st birthday, when in 1822, the composer Bernhard Josef Klein published settings of six of Miller's poems, the latter thanked him in these words. For indeed, my songs lead but a half a life, a, a paper existence of black and white, until music breathes life into them, or at least calls it forth and awakens it, if it is already dormant in them. The irony is that Miller never heard Schubert settings of either his earlier poetic cycle, Die Schöne Müllerin, The Beautiful Miller Girl, or of Winterreiser though he surely heard earlier settings by other less fabled composers. Schubert's radical abbreviation of Miller's title is telling. This is not Miller's Die Winterreise, but just Winterreise. Schubert was quite used to altering literary material to suit his purposes. Um, he does that all the way through his songs. But by removing the definite article from Miller's poetic cycle, he did two particular things. I think he made the work his own, something distinct from its originating material and owing no loyal to it, loyalty to it beyond the use he could make of it in moulding it to his own purposes. Secondly, he made it more abstract, less definite, more open, and from our perspective, more modern. Winterizer has a starkness which is utterly true to its material in a way that de Winterizer would not be. Anyone can own this journey. Müller's poems appeal to Schubert for all sorts of reasons, some very personal and specific. The cycle ends, for example, with a poem about a musician. Some more general. The theme of the outcast, cursed by a failed love, would surely have appealed to a man such as Schubert, who was suffering from the early stages of syphilis. But the overarching aesthetic, formal appeal has to be the way in which the Winterreiser poems seem to beg for music, as Müller himself recognised. Goethe's being resistant to the musical appropriation of his verse didn't stop Schubert setting a great number of his poems more than by any other poet. And Goethe's resistance didn't impede Schubert's success in setting them. them. Interestingly, his poems are far more amenable to such treatment than those of his friend and contemporary Schiller, whom Schubert set on almost as many occasions, but often with less startling success. The mysterious subjectivity of Müller's Die Winterreiser, on the contrary, actually cries out to be inhabited and filled in by Schubert's music. The psychology of our wanderer becomes more present to us through music. So too does his physical environment, so dense with metaphor, as the composer brings to bear that complex method of using a motif in the piano to suggest a physical analogy. The steady tread of Gute Nacht, for example, and the cycle yields many, many more. And then that, in turn, is subjected to the musical invocation of shifting emotion. That inner emotional intensity is externalized, characterized, even dramatized, because the song is written to be sung. It is given voice. <coughs> so 
Some years before his discovery of the Winterreise poems, Schubert made his only attempt at an extended piece of literary prose. A few poems are ascribed to him and, of course, quite a few letters. It's headed Mein Traum, My Dream, and it's not clear from the text itself whether it's a record of a dream or an invention, a fable. What is clear is that in it, Schubert imagines himself as exactly the sort of hero, though hero is hardly the word, Miller has in mind for his winter's journey. And here's Schubert. With a heart filled with endless love for those who scorned me, I wandered far away. For many and many a year I sang songs. Whenever I tried to sing of love, it turned to pain. And again, when I tried to sing of pain, it turned to love. It's not surprising that when Schubert came upon 12 of the poems in the Almanach Urania sometime in the mid-1820s, he was immediately seized by them and almost compelled to set them to music. His friends later wrote of him promising them new songs and then failing to turn up as agreed to sing them. Were these the Winterizer songs? When did he perform the cycle to them? Um, singing, sorry. When he did perform the cycle to them, singing to his own accompaniment, they didn't really like it, as we've seen. Um, to, and Schubert replied, I, I like these songs more than all the rest, and you will come to like them as much as as I do. He knew he was inv involved in something quite revolutionary in the field of song. In choosing and composing the cycle, Schubert recognised the opportunity that Miller offered him. Their musical and poetic methods were quite in tune. Miller's use of Byron's method of absence was even enhanced by the composer serendipitously because of the way he had discovered and then set the poems. There is, of course, also something immensely contemporary, modern or is it perhaps postmodern, about the displacement of narrative in Schubert's Winterreise. In his book, Reality Hunger, a montage of unattributed quotations and self-quotation, dealing with the inadequacy of traditional literary form in confronting a modern, fragmented reality, the American author David Shields tells us that the absence of plot leaves the reader room to think about other things. Momentum, he declares, derives not from narrative, but from the subtle build-up of thematic resonances. Many of the patchwork of literary fragments he assembles would do just as good a job as epigraphs to Winterreiser, or a book about or around Winterreiser. I have a narrative, but you will be put to it to find it. I'm not interested in collage as the refuge of the compositionally disabled. I'm interested in collage as, to be honest, an evolution beyond narrative. Plot, like erected scaffolding, is torn down and what stands in its place is the thing itself. How much can one remove and still have the composition be intelligible? This understanding or its lack divides those who can write from those who can really write. Chekhov removed the plot. Pinter, elaborating, removed the history, the narration. Beckett, the characterization. We hear it anyway. Omission is a form of creation. The mention of Beckett is particularly interesting because Beckett was a great admirer of Schubert, I think was very influenced by him in his method of construction, and he particularly loved Winterreiser. And there's something recognisably and uncannily, preemptively Beckettian about the piece. The fact that Shields' snippets come from such varied 20th and 21st century sources, the modernist novelist Juna Barnes, the playwright David Mamet, and Shields himself, is a measure of the modern persistence of the call to be fragmentary. Looking in turn at Winterreiser, what we need to remember is that none of these urges are modern. They are as old as Miller and Byron and Schubert, and again, much, much older. Reality has, after all, always been fragmented, is no more so now than it was then, any then. And she would, we should remember, consequently, that Winterreiser is by no means old hat. <coughs> Let us now return to the elements of the poem, the crucial details which set the drama. Fremd bin ich ein, fremd bin ich eingezogen, we are told. That word fremd, most often translated as a noun, rather than the adjective it actually is. A stranger I came, a stranger I departed. But that commonplace German adjective carries with it a whole penumbra of meaning, a history, and a cloud of connotation. In a modern German dictionary, we find the following attempts to capture, in English, its many meanings. Someone else's, different, foreign, alien, strange, other, different, outside. 
It is unexpectedly an English word too, if a much less familiar one. We find it in Chaucer, meaning foreign or unfriendly. Its etymology shared with the German and also with similar words in, among many others, Swedish, Dutch and West Frisian, finds its earliest trace, according to some etymologies, in a proto-Indo-European prefix, meaning forth or forward. A nice thought, given that trudging sense of going forth that Schubert's music gives us. Hostile is another English meaning, as well as not related or of another house, akin to the proto-Germanic word for not one's own, meanings of singular relevance to this fractured narrative of a marriage, forbidden or foregone. This trawl through the dictionaries is more than idle fact-grubbing, I think. It gives us a poetic handle on our hero's predicament. The word friend stands at the head of the cycle, the poetic cycle, the song cycle, and it's repeated, it's crucial. The word friend can also send us back to a song of Schubert's which was in the 19th century as popular as Erlkönig or Gretchen am Spinnrade is now, a song whose central musical theme became the motivic motor of Schubert's titanic piece for solo piano, the so-called Wanderer Fantasy. This song, Der Wanderer, was written in 1816 and published in 1821, setting a poem by, by Georg Philipp Schmidt von Lübeck. That main middle section of the song, pulsating with melancholia and homesickness, paints a picture of a world emptied of meaning of, and affect, in which the poetic voice presents himself as a Fremdling, an outcast, a stranger, a foreigner. The notion of the outcast wanderer was a commonplace of romantic culture Europe-wide, and wandering is notoriously a feature of Schubert's songs. Schubert's other song cycle to poems of Müller, Die Schöne Müllerin, starts with a song called Das Wandern, Wandering, and tells us, with apparent nonchalance and good cheer, that wandering is a Müller's delight. Journeymen have to wander, of course, to find work. That's why they're called journeymen. There's nothing darkly existential in play here, not on the surface at least. Schmidt's wanderer, on the other hand, wanders because he is in some way hollowed out or literally displaced. The song ends with the words, dort wo du nicht bist, dort ist das Glück. There where you are not, there is happiness. This reads like depression, but there is also something more historically specific to unpick. The friendling is a foreigner in his own land. This was a notion with a particular resonance for people like Georg Schmidt, Wilhelm Müller, or Franz Schubert, living in the territories of what had been the Holy Roman Empire, Empire of the German nation, dissolved by Napoleon in 1806, and only semi-resurrected in the Restoration Settlement of 1815. A settlement which, while aiming to preserve the territorial integrity of the Habsburg Imperium, a multi-ethnic assemblage of lands half masquerading as a modern state, its capital city, Vienna, put a tight lid on expressions of German nationalism. Germany as a nation did not, of course, exist. Outside the Habsburg domains, German states including, included small principalities, such as Anhalt Dessau, where Müller lived and worked as ducal librarian, free cities like Schmidt's Hanseatic Lübeck, and major powers such as Prussia. Sovereignty was confused and overlapping. For Germans in these lands and in Austria, this was the period known as Biedermeier, between the nationalistic uprising against Napoleon of 1814-15, in which Müller participated as a soldier, and which Schubert celebrated in song, and the bourgeois nationalist revolutions of 1848. Those revolutions failed, but 23 years later, a new Prussian-led German empire was proclaimed at Versailles, forged by blood and iron. <clears throat> the great Prussian statesman Otto von Bismarck had managed to exclude the Habsburgs from any role in the creation of a German national state. But of course, none of this was preordained, and many thought that a settlement of the German national question could have included Austria, and many German speakers indeed hoped that it would. <coughs> to live as a German in Dessau, like Müller, or in Vienna, like Schubert, or in Lübeck, like Georg Schmidt in the 1820s, was then to live as a Fremdling with a sense that national borders did not coincide with linguistic realities or cultural yearnings, a sense that to be a German nationalist was to be in opposition to the established order, to be at odds with authority. It was an experience of alienation, entfremdung. Liberalism and nationalism went hand in hand, 
both of them suppressed in the clampdown imposed by the Habsburg government of Metternich and its allies in the German Confederation. The Biedermeyer era was one in which the excitement of the revolutionary and Napoleonic years was to be repressed. The metaphors have been much the same in our own time. If there had been a political springtime within living memory, the Josephine reforms of the 1780s in the Habsburg realms, the nationalist surge of 18 to 14 to 15 in Germany at large, this in the 1820s was now winter time. Schubert, born in, 18, in 1797, and Müller, born in 1794, give us a winter journey that became a metaphor for an era. When Heinrich Heine, that admirer of Wilhelm Müller, published his satirical verse epic on the German political scene in 1844, he called it Deutschland ein Wintermärchen, Germany a winter's tale, making explicit the political undercurrents which swirl beneath Winterreiser's Biedermeier surface. Alienation is woven all the way through Winterreiser. There is the very simple personal sense of the word. The estrangement which follows a love affair is, after all, the way the cycle starts. But there's also the sort of alienation which makes Winterreiser a pre-echo of so much 20th century philosophy and literature. Laid out in its very first word, fremd, is a connection with absurdism, existentialism, and a whole slew of other 20th century isms, with characters out of Beckett, Camus, or Paul Auster. Schubert's was an age in which, and for perhaps for the first time, to be a human being could seem very lonely in a metaphysical sense, an empty universe without meaning. The first hints from a nascent geology, James Hutton had published his theory of the Earth in 1795, that Earth's history was built out of a deep time at odds with the workings of the everyday human imagination. Nature was not friendly, not even hostile. One faced the possibility that it was simply indifferent. Schöne Welt, wo bist du? Beautiful world, where are you? wrote Friedrich Schiller in a poem set by Schubert in 1819. A poem which was a lament for a world emptied of meaning and significance, for that lost wholeness which Greek civilization mythically embodied. Schubert's Winterreiser is one vessel by which this newborn, fractured, half-hearted modernity has been tra transmitted to its even bleaker successors. Words and music in a dynamic union, it renders this vision right at the outset at its historical be beginning somehow beautiful. Now I can't of course run through the whole of the cycle in this sort of detail, but before we end with the last song, Der Leiermann, the hurdy-gurdy, I just want to pick on a couple of other historical details uh, in the songs which despite the fragmentariness, the lack of information which Müller intended and Schubert amplified, can bring us further into the world of the cycle. <coughs> Until I sat down to write a book about Winterreiser, the question of why the protagonist is in the girl's house at the beginning of the cycle, which is very odd, had never seemed worth much consideration. But, but why would a young man of lower economic status, as becomes clear in the next song, be living in a house with a young woman and her family? Why did he come to stay? The answer has to be private tutoring, uh, not in our 21st century sense, but in the 18th century sense. The biggest bestseller of the 18th century, according to Robert Danton, was Rousseau's La Nouvelle Héloise, an epistolary novel in which the heroine, Julie, a young Swiss woman of noble family, falls in love with Saint-Preux, her tutor, a man of humble origins. At least 70 editions were in print before 1800 probably more than for any novel in the previous history of publishing. And demand outran supply to such an extent that publishers rented the book out by the day and even the hour. <laughs> One reader wrote to Rousseau, I dare not tell you the effect it made on me. No, I was past weeping. A sharp pain convulsed me. My heart was crushed. The novel had a huge and persistent resonance in late 18th and early 19th century Germany. August Wilhelm Schlegel, Fichter, Hegel and Schelling, all of them and many more, worked as house tutors and emotional complications often ensued. The poet Hölderlin famously fell in love with the mother of the children he was teaching and immortalised her as his Diotima. And Franz Schubert, music tutor to the Esterhazy family on their estate at Zelitz, fell in love with a certain star, as one of his friends called her, the Countess Carolina, with whom he played four-handed pieces 
so their hands could get all muddled up, and to whom he dedicated some of his work. You are the ornament and oracle of an entire family, the boast and admiration of a whole town, writes saint preux de Julie. These, all these, divide your sensibility, and what remains for love is but a small part in comparison of that which is ravished from you by duty, nature, and friendship. But I, alas, a wanderer without a family and almost without country, have no one but you upon earth and am possessed of nothing but my love. Thinking about Rousseau's Nouvelle Louise may help us to understand. Winterreise. Mid-cycle, Schubert lifts the pace with his setting of Müller's poem, Die Post, the post, and here's the piano opening, post horn and all. <laughs> It's another link with Rousseau's world, as the cycle's protagonist, encountering a mail coach, remembers that there will be no love letter for him. Despite the inevitable disappoint disappointment, we still hear the expectation in the music, the expectation he no doubt used to feel. The excitement Rousseau in La Nouvelle Louise describes was obviously familiar to Schubert. How was I tormented in receiving the letter which I so impatiently expected? The mail was scarce opened before I gave him my name and began to importune the man. He told me there was a letter for me. My heart leapt. That excitement, an excitement remembered, which Schubert manages to convey, is all of a piece with the endorphin rush which modern day lovers experience when the email buzzes or the SMS pings. <laughs> Horns, in German and French romantic literature, and elsewhere in Winterreiser, indeed, like the horn calls that interrupt the rustling of the leaves in the piano introduction to the song we heard before, Der Lindenbaum, they, those sorts of horns symbolize, can symbolize memory, regret, the past. We find them in music, we find them in German romantic literature. The lively horn calls of the mail coach are surely very different. Express Post had been introduced into Prussia in 1821 and Austria in 1823. A contemporary in 1825 spoke of the entirely new life which had been given to the vehicular post in Germany. Timetales were coordinated, timekeeping standardized, journey time slashed, suspension improved, giving passengers the impression they were gliding along. All this a decade or more before passenger railway services began their transformational work. In 1849, Thomas de Quincey recalled the lost glories of the English mail coach through velocity at that time unprecedented, they first revealed the glory of motion. For us, <coughs> the mail coach might seem to be antique, a piece of pickwickery, quintessentially Dickensian. But I think it's worth remembering that in 1828, it was an agent of modernity, less poetic than practical, and quite at odds with the alienated wanderer on foot who has chosen to stand outside his own society. I want to end this talk by performing with Osman the last song of Winterreiser, the, <coughs> the bleakest and most modern insensibility of all, Der Leiermann, the hurdy-gurdy player. And I'll start by reading you the poem in English. Over there, behind the village, stands a hurdy-gurdy man, and with numb fingers he grinds away as best he can. Barefoot on the ice, he sways back and forth, and his little plate remains always empty. No one wants to hear him, no one looks at him, and the dogs growl around the old man. And he lets it go on, everything, just as it will. Turns the wheel, and his hurdy-gurdy never stays still for a moment. Strange old man, should I go with you? Will you play your hurdy-gurdy to my songs? There's a romantic irony embedded in the very title of the poem. The lyre in German, or lyre in English, was the most romantic of instruments <coughs> When Schubert's friend Theodor Körner, who died in the Wars of Liberation, had a posthumous collection of his pub poems published by his father in 1814, it was given a title which was meant to express the poles of his life and poetic imagination. Liar und Schwert, Liar and Sword. The verses that Schubert set <coughs> to create, create his leader, the poems which Wilhelm Miller wrote and which he tr imagined transformed by music, these were lyric poems, meant in fantasy at least, to be delivered by a performer strumming a lyre. Lyres were everywhere in this period, embossed in gold on the leather covers of the commonplace books of teenage girls, adorning innumerable pieces of Biedermeyer furniture in respectable bourgeois establishments, 
and dignifying John Keats's gravestone in the English cemetery at Rome. So how fabulously apt it would have been to have ended this cycle with a lyre song. How poignant, how poetic, how decent. Instead, we have the low-down, vulgar, mechanical and repetitive sound of the Drehleier, the hurdy-gurdy, played by a beggar whom one would hardly dignify with the word musician and evoked in a piano part of haunting Spano. <laughs> As the first of the canonical great composers to have made his living solely in the marketplace without a patron, <coughs> a position in the court or church, or a musical sinecure of any sort, the fear of lost status was woven into Schubert's existence, as well as the fear of penury. And these make Dear Liar Man a particularly fitting end to the cycle. It's in this last song that we hear the piano as separate from the protagonist for the first time a notional source of alternative subjectivity, however pinched and etiolated, presents itself, the hurdy-gurdy player. And what is achieved in the end is both a wonderful circularity, the musical poetic serpent biting its own tail, and the tantalising offer of narrative closure and an, and an explanation of what this journey has been. Up until now, the audience has experienced the cycle as a monodrama, but now we see the possibility that the hurdy-gurdy player may have been there all along as companion and may have been the occasion for the wanderer singing his songs. Will you play your hurdy-gurdy to my songs? The wanderer asks. If the answer were to be a sturdy yes, then the crazy but logical procedure would be to go right back to the beginning of the cycle and start all over again. Either with the notion of eternal recurrence in mind, we are trapped in the endless re repetition of this existential lament, and remember how we saw the first song beginning as if it had been going on forever. Or we can interpret the first sing-through of the cycle as being the mono monodrama with piano, uh, and then every subsequent performance should be to the accompaniment of the hurdy-gurdy. A momentary swell of passion in the hurdy-gurdy come piano, just as the voice ceases. Empathy between the two outcasts, we may ask, is succeeded by diminution to pianissimo, and a final, a final cadence, which in its open-endedness allows us the freedom to choose our own ending.
Yes, yes. OK. <laughs> Anyone wants to ask a question? Would I, I make a comment? comment? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Fremd, bin ich eingezogen. Fremd, ziehe ich wieder aus. Could you translate it as nobody knew me when I came, nobody wants to know me, now I'm going? Right. I mean, it's a purely a social friend. Yeah. And one little detail that is worth mentioning is the line at the end of the th third poem, I think it is, your child is a rich bride. Yeah. So what has happened to him is that his nose has been put out of joint yeah. by a better match. The woman, yeah. the mother, sees him as a potential catch, yeah. and then something better comes along. So it's very much within the Biedermeyer family setting. Yeah. of social climbing, social ambition, and trying to place one's daughter as advantageously. As yes, well. which then also relates then to Imdorfer, the song later on, where he talks about bourgeois, I mean, petty bourgeois dreams that vanish, uh, and it connects to that social climbing. So to that happens. extent, he's a, a disappointed lover who's been put out by the family that originally thought he was worth cultivating. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. Hello. In that case, it sounds more as if the mother had an eye on her, him herself, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that ambiguity. I mean, I, I, I don't know. That I do think the text is full of ambiguities, and one can try and piece it together. But there are there are definitely definitely holes. And even in even saying, uh, you know, your daughter is a rich bride is it's not absolutely I think crystal clear. It's sort of there are certain likelihoods, and, but also there are other possibilities on the table. I think. Hello. I wondered when you, when you say that um, Byron was very much a, a, an inspiration to these, why aren't Byron poems set to the music in? I mean, why, why are these lesser poems? Why do they make much better music than maybe the Byron poems? Um, I don't know. I mean, the only Byron poems I, I have <coughs> sung are settings by Schumann. Um, so that much later, <coughs> I suppose the sheer familiarity of, of, the, of the Byron poems may have been a disincentive, though Schubert was perfectly happy to set um, Scott, uh, with whom he was very familiar, and set Scott very famously, and there was a Scott craze. Um, I don't know what was available in terms of trans translation for Schubert, um, but that's an interesting, an interesting question. But I think there is more openness in Müller, um, which, which allows setting. But on the other hand, Schubert, as I say, set Goethe very successfully. And Goethe is a, a, is a poet who really didn't want music to add anything to his verse. He wanted musical settings of his verse to be as plain, simple, and uh, pretty boring as they possibly could be. <laughs> Hello. Um, the, uh, the fifth song, I think, uh, why Oh, I've got lots, <laughs> lots of sort of theories of that. The linden tree is, um, it has a sort of place in romantic literature. It, fe it features quite prominently in, in the, you know, the most famous German novel of, of slightly earlier period, but that continued to have enormous fame, Werther. Uh, it has a very iconic presence in Werther. Um, it's also, the Lindenbaum is, is the tree of the, the sort of the, the, the thing. It's where, it's where people gather. It's, it's a, in some sense, it may represent German nationalism. Um, I think those are my two, two, at least two of the ideas that I've come up with. But uh, I don't know if anyone's got any others. Hello. Right. Yes, yeah. Yes, and the Vaughan appears in the, later in the cycle in a rather unexpected way. Yeah. Hello. I'm interested in your suggestion that you think uh, literarism is possibly underperformed slightly. As someone told me that to remember when performances of Vivaldi's season were a rarity. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's underperformed. I think it's just it's it's performed within its niche and doesn't have much salience outside. 
I, I, it's only that I, I, I remember when I'd started writing this book, I went to a party at the London Library and talked to somebody, you know, a very well-educated person who was writing, was writing military history, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm writing a book about Winterreiser. And he said, what's that? And I said, um, it's a song cycle by Sh Schubert. And he said, oh, very recherche. And I, <laughs> that, that irritated me into feeling that I wanted to give it, that's why I said all this stuff about putting it on a level with these other acknowledged uh, canonical works. I mean, I know the whole idea of a canon is now very unfashionable, but I, I, this isn't, to me, this is a crucial work of you know, the Western cultural imagination. Hello. Uh, you talked about the way uh, Byron and Scott's were fantastically influential in translation. Is there any room for singing this in English? Um, or is it so wedded to the German poetry that the loss would be greater than the gain in accessibility to some audiences? I would find it very... Um, I'd find it very difficult. I don't know if um, Roy Foster is here, but um, he was on... The other week he was on... Uh, Private Passions, playing a recording which he loves, and which many, many, many people love, of a singer called Harry Plunkett Green singing the last um, song of Winterreiser. And I, c I can't take it. I find it, I don't know why, but I find it ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so it's difficult because, I mean, I, I have sung, I've sung Janacek in translation, but I've worked on the translation and had a sort of commitment to the translation. And I, uh, maybe if one really, really worked at it, but I, I think it w I'd find it very difficult. Hello. Somebody mentioned that we've had two courses of Winterreiser in the last month in uh, Oxford, and one of them was Peter Yorke, who was mm. uh, in Germany, and he said that the Schubert project is part of the Oxford Reader Festival. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many people were, were, were there at that. I, I was really struck by um, your interpretation of Winterreiser, which was very angry, mm. uh, very, very outside, very outside society, mm. uh, this, this speaker. And, and for me, I think it was a, 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 an absolutely brilliant performance, um, which for me took Vintage nearer to the demonic right. than anything I've ever heard. Um, as that form of yeah. his work. <coughs> I didn't, it's funny, I, I, I know, I mean, people often use the word expressionist about the way that I do it, and I'm always trying to pull back, and I never really managed to pull back very far, it seems, because I've gone such a long way, a long doing. And I, I do find it in the music. I do find it in the sort of Schubertian sensibility. I find the Schubertian sensibility very, very it's this extraordinary combination of the gemütlich and the, and the violent. I mean, you, you hear it in the playing of somebody like Alfred Brendel when he plays Schubert sonatas. Sudden outbreak breaks of tremendous frustration and violence. And you see it in Schubert's own life. I mean, if I can find in here the, the extraordinary... Um, um, hang on. Where is it? Um, I don't think I can find it. But anyway, he w at one stage he'd, he'd gone to a, a, to taste the Hoyerger in a in a in a pub outside Vienna, and there were some musicians there, and um, they said they'd like him, you know, like him to write them a piece. And he went completely bananas and said, "I am Franz Schubert, who will be known. You are just." blowers and puffers and an extraordinary sense of repressed rage. And I, th I think that was something in, we think of Schubert, the sort of tubby tunesmith, but he was this man full of frustration, I think, and I see it there in the music. Thank you very much.